Welcome to the Thyroidist Life Podcast with me, Dr. Rebecca Warren. This podcast is for you if you're healing after thyroidectomy or you've been diagnosed with a thyroid disorder or think you might have a thyroid disorder and want to understand what it looks like to truly get yourself well. Quite frankly, I wanted to share all the information that I wish I knew a decade and a half ago when I was diagnosed with a thyroid issue, had my thyroid cut out, had high dose radiation and left there feeling worse than before. And that's why I made this podcast. So I can share that information with you. So you can take that information, implement it and truly get yourself well starting today. All right, guys. So we are back at it and we're talking about all things foundational for healing post thyroidectomy and healing uh, your thyroid, right? Now I get asked questions around where to start. Whenever someone heals they have a thyroid disorder or whenever someone ends up in a situation where their doctor tells them that they have thyroid cancer or they have their thyroid removed, like where do I start? Where do I start if I want to heal my thyroid? Where do I start, uh, you know, if I actually want to make sure I'm well and I'm optimal post-thyroidectomy or my doctor says I might have thyroid cancer. Now, I think the biggest disfavor that has happened when it comes to thyroid issues and thyroid cancer is that within the medical system, it's really easy. It's it's very easy to take care of your thyroid issue. They make it seem like, oh, you have a thyroid problem. Boom, we have the solution. Get on Synthroid. Oh, you have thyroid cancer. Let's cut it out uh, and put you on a pill. If you're post-thyroidectomy, like you shouldn't have any issues, right? Because you got it taken care of. I think that's just the biggest disfavor that is being taught to thousands upon thousands of people, every new people every single year, let alone the millions of people that are being affected by this. No, thyroid healing is not this simple thing. Um, being optimal post-thyroidectomy, it's not going to be as simple as just taking one same dose for the rest of your life. You've been lied to when it comes to that. And so when I get questions like on social media, like, oh, Dr. Rebecca, you know, how do I get my thyroid antibodies down? Or how do I get, you know, increase my thyroid conversion? I just think to myself, oh, man, there's so many paths that you can take. And I don't know where you should start because I don't know you personally. I don't know your medical history. And throughout these different episodes, as I'm releasing them over time, I'm going to hit on different layers. But the way I talk about healing, healing your body, right? It's going to be a layered approach that you take one layer, you address that, you go after that. And then when you're improving, when you see an increase of quality of life, as you're getting better, then you go to that next layer, which means you have to change your thinking about what it looks like to be well. Being well doesn't mean you get to a point where you no longer, you're, you're just going to get there and you're good, right? Right. We live in a way too stressful, way too toxic world where companies and food companies and the government, they are passing, releasing and selling things for profit, for power and not for your health. So we can't just live in this world bombarded by all this stuff and think that, you know, we're going to be okay if we're not always working on our health. So how does healing look like post thyroidectomy? How does healing look like if you have a thyroid disorder is I want you to get it into your head that it's not okay, I'm going to get to a point where everything's fixed. But that five years from now, you're going to be better than you are today. 10 years from now, you're going to be aging backwards because aging there is aging in your age and then there's cellular aging. And my favorite thing in the world is I have people that see me for wellness and prevention and just if anything pops up, you know, the thing I love the most is when they look back at when they started to work with me, they say how much better they feel, you know, especially a lot of my older, you know, clients, they're like, I, I had one woman who was a kindergarten teacher and I mean, she was diabetic and she had all these things going on and she was like, man, when I came in to see you, I would have to spend most of my time in a chair and now I can run after these kids. And that was like three or four years afterwards. That's what health is, is the, the, the fact that as you get older, you don't get worse. We've been sold on this idea that once you get to 60, 
you're old and it, it is what it is. Like you're just going to break down, right? I have people tell me that in their 40s. Well, my doctor says it's because I'm getting older. And I'm like, what? But you're 45 or like even 60. And I want to make sure that if you're following me, if you're listening to me, it doesn't have to be that way. And that is not true. It, you can improve with age, and especially if you view your health that way, that it's not going to be this destination, but it's a journey that you get better. And that also means that in some seasons, you're investing more money. You're investing more in supplements and, and protocols and different things. And then other seasons, you're doing less, but you're always doing something to support your body. So that's how you know I approach thyroid healing. That's how I approach healing post-thyroidectomy or healing from, you know, thyroid cancer, like within your thyroid, right? Supporting your body's healing process. That's, that's really important. So when I talk about layers, obviously, I've shared this before, there's, I think it's the second episode, I go over labs. That's where you got to start. That is number one step. If you're post-thyroidectomy or thyroid cancer, make sure your thyroid hormones are okay because that affects, there's not a cell in your body that's not affected by those thyroid hormones. And then um, if you have a thyroid disorder, you know, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, you want to make sure that those levels are within a range that is not going to disrupt your day-to-day function, right? I think it's insane that there's so many people out there that are hypothyroid or they're suboptimal in their hormones. And they're having to kind of suffer through brain fog and memory and like weight loss resistance. And it's so frustrating. You wouldn't believe how many women come to see me or are in my membership group. And they're like, man, I've been doing fasting. And it's so frustrating because I hear all these amazing things that can happen with fasting, but I don't see it. And I'm like, well, yeah, because your body is really stressed out right now. Fasting is a good stressor, but it's still a stressor. And your metabolism is completely slowed down. So you're going to lose, maybe lose a little bit of weight, but you're going to gain it back. Your body is in the survival mode because this really important hormone, that active thyroid hormone, isn't where it should be. So that is the first step. So go back, make sure you listen to my thyroid labs. If you haven't gotten my optimal thyroid lab ebook, go to drrebeccawarren.com, get your ebook. And in that ebook, it goes even further. So get that ebook. Listen to the episode on thyroid labs, but the ebook itself goes even further. It goes into pretty much what's in my wellness panel that I do for myself and, you know, what I recommend for my um, membership, for people in my membership and for the women in my membership and what I order and recommend people order if they want to start understanding if they're well, where to start, right? So make sure you get both of those things. Now, after you've gotten your blood work done and addressed any kind of deficiencies that may be there, now is when you get to the foundational things. And that's what I'm talking about in this episode. So what does that mean, the foundational things? And I remember I have a decade and a half, over a decade and a half of personal experience in healing um, from thyroid disorders, thyroid cancer, getting my thyroid removed, right, gut disorder, toxicity, but also have all these years of experience of working um, with both men and women. I focus on women now, but I honestly, if I'm being real with you, like I wish someone would have told me this when I first heard, like when they first told me there's this tumor in my thyroid. I wish I would have known about this after my surgery. That's a really stressful thing on your body after my radiation, which is really stressful on my body. I wish I would have known there are these simple things that have such a big impact on your body, how it responds to stress, how it heals. And the foundational things, there's, I feel like they're so simple. I'm the type of person that goes zero to 100, right? My husband always makes fun of me because when I first started detoxing years ago, detoxing, real detoxing, not just like celery juice, right? Real detoxing pulls toxins and you go low and slow. But I'm like, no, if I'm detoxing, let me just go ahead and get everything out and just dump everything out, which is such a horrible idea. And I paid for it. And when I started reading more and more research about these things I'm going to share with you, I'm like, oh my gosh, like it doesn't have to be that complicated to introduce things into our lifestyle that 
will be major in helping your body heal and rebalance and helping your thyroid and helping you find a balance within your thyroid medication. And that's when I, what I want to share with you guys. So another thing I always teach about the foundational things, the foundation is that what foundational things are, and this is how I view it, and this is how you need to view it, is that this body, the miracle isn't when you get better. And I always warn that to the women I work with, right? I never, I, I tell them straight up, like, I don't treat you. I don't heal you. I am not healing you. My job with all my clinical experience, my research ex, you know, experience, my personal experience, my job is to identify stressors, these blocks that are stopping your body from doing what it's created to do and it's to heal itself, right? I don't do the healing. And so when people get well, when people start seeing these changes in their lab work, I'm like, no, 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 the miracle isn't that you were told you weren't going to get better and then you got better. That was a lie to begin with. The miracle is the day you were created in the womb when you were given the ability to heal. That as you were birthed and as you lived throughout this life, even during seasons where you have felt like crap or you got diagnosed with thyroid cancer, even in those seasons where you where it felt like your body let you down, your body didn't. It's this chronic um, stressors, this your body having to work overtime to deal with these stressors you weren't told about, right? Because even through all of that, even right now as you're listening to me, your heart's beating, your lungs breathing, you're listening to this and you don't even have to think about it. You cut yourself, you heal, right? And so the foundational things are things that we were created to have, that our body was created to connect with, to interact with, right? Right? So that it can do what it's created to do and it's to heal and to function and to be balanced. It wants to survive, right? And these things we're meant to have. And when we start disconnecting from these things, then our bodies become dysfunctional. And then they start creating problems because we're lacking things that we need. And I say all of that because when I share about things like earthing and sunlight, when I share with, um, you know, working your lymphatic system, that's not just because you go outside barefoot and we have studies on all the things that can improve just going outside barefoot that's not that like the barefoot I, I hope that makes sense it's not like it's not like a prescription like hey you take this pill that makes you better it's not the going outside barefoot that's making you better it's the fact that you were meant to be barefoot you were meant to interact with the ionic charges on earth and because you're lacking that, you're lacking something essential, right? When you reintroduce it, then you have something essential that you have reintroduced for your body. And I think the easiest way to understand it is you need water, right? You need water. That's a really severe thing that if you like miss, you're definitely going to know, right? And so if you don't drink water and you get dehydrated, what happens? You're going to have problems. And then when you drink water, this essential thing, uh, especially water with minerals, uh, we'll do a whole episode on water and minerals, but um, when you start, when you introduce that, your body does what? It rebalances, it goes back into functioning optimally. So that's the biggest thing to understand. These things in particular, can they create some big significant changes? absolutely the studies are there but I always want you to understand that it's your body that heals itself it's your body that rebalances itself and the reason why you're doing this is to give your body all the things it needs to do what it's created to do right heal function balance and respond to stressors and this is the last point I'll leave on this before we jump into all the different things is that health is your body's ability to respond to stress your body's ability to adapt to stress, adapt to viruses, adapt to toxins, adapt to work stress, to family stress, and have an appropriate response and then return to more of a balanced state. That's what health is. When you start to have a thyroid that's dysfunctional, when you start to grow these thyroid nodules and even post-thyroidectomy, you've got to take into consideration that now your body has a big block right? It can have a big block where it's not going to respond to things appropriately, whether you're exposed to a virus, whether you're exposed to mold, whether you're exposed to uh, 
uh, pollen, right? like allergies. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh my goodness. The, the so many people that cannot handle pollen, but what about all the other people that can, right? It's your body's inability to respond to stressors. So everything that we're working on is supporting your body to be in a more balanced state to be able to respond to stressors appropriately. That's that next step. That's the foundational things. So let's jump right in, shall we? Okay, the first thing I'm going to tell you guys and when I started looking into this, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so simple. But wow, it's so, it's such a big deal is light. It's sunlight. It's light. Uh, and, and not sunlight through your window. It's going outside and getting sunlight and especially getting sunlight at the most optimal times in the day. So let me take a step back and explain the thyroid adrenal, like this thyroid adrenal connection that can exist there. Um, and why it's so important to understand that connection so that you can understand how light and your circadian clock and when you sleep and when you wake can affect things, right? So, you know, we know there's an HPT axis, the hypothalamus pituitary and thyroid. Hypothalamus is always sensing internal, external environment to determine what needs to happen to best support you. And then your pituitary, that's what's going to release that TSH, which talks to your thyroid to release hormones or not release hormones, right? Even if you don't have a thyroid, you still have that hypothalamus pituitary connection going there. So even though you don't have a thyroid, you can still test for TSH because it comes from the pituitary, right? But there's also something called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access. Now that access is a really big important system to understand if you have a thyroid disorder or you're on thyroid meds and I'll make that connection here in a second for you so the purpose of the HPA access is to let the body know am I safe or am I not safe am I in sympathetic or parasympathetic right you have an autonomic nervous system and that autonomic nervous system only has two responses it's sympathetic I'm in a fight or flight or freeze right? You ever get so scared you like, or kind of like paralyze a second, right? Fight or fight or flee, freeze, or parasympathetic, which is rest, digest, and heal. And your hypothalamus is always looking at that environment, communicates with the pituitary, and the pituitary communicates with all the hormones in your body to respond to the lack of stressors or the presence of stressors. But it's the HPA, the adrenals, that will determine if we're going to stay in that sympathetic state or not, all right? And the system is amazing. You know, we whenever we hear about cortisol, we hear that it, it can be a really, really bad thing and dysfunction, all this stuff. But cortisol has kept us alive since the beginning of human existence. It's our ability to survive famines and wars, the ability to respond to work stressors, chronic work stressors. Um, it's our ability to put on, you know, to see gains in the gym. Having cortisol, it, it's important for our immune system. It's important for our whole entire body. It is a great system when it is functioning appropriately, right? So if you are, you know, in ancestral times and you're with your family and you guys are hiking through the woods, foraging food, and you hear something behind you and it's a bear, a bear big old black bear, right? Without even having to think about it, right? Without having to be like, oh my gosh, there's a bear. Like your body senses that tension, that awareness. And immediately you get that firing of the hypothalamus pituitary to the adrenals. You release some adrenaline hormones first, but eventually you release that cortisol. Because what is cortisol going to do? It's going to get you into a sympathetic, right? It, it's going to get you to a place where now you're in fight or flight. You're going to have to fight this bear. You're going to have to run away. You're going to have to hide. Hopefully you don't just freeze there because you're so scared. And everything that happens in that state is appropriate, right? You, you're going to have high blood pressure. You're going to have high heart rate, right? Because you're, why? Because your heart is pumping harder, right? You're going to have increased blood flow to your hands and to your feet because you're going to, again, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to run. You know what's going to happen to the other systems that are not important, they're going to slow down and shut down. Is it important to run away or to digest uh, your meal that you had that morning? 
It's important to run away. Is it important to make thyroid hormones in that moment? No. Is it important to be able to conceive and, and produce these sex hormones? No. Is it important to give it? No. Anything that is not a part of survival is going to slow down and shut down. And everything that is a part of survival is going to go and it's going to take precedence, right? It's a hierarchy of needs. So you get away from the bear. And let's say you find shelter and that's what's supposed to happen, right? When you encounter a stressor, you respond appropriately, then you're supposed to, that, that stressor is supposed to be removed. And you go away, and now your body senses it's safe, it's in shelter, and so now that cortisol goes down, that cortisol is not being, you know, released in your body, and you can go into this parasympathetic state. Now you can rest, digest, heal. You're going to have normal bowel movements now. You're going to, um, you know, be able to pee and poop and, you know, eat and do all this stuff, right? Because now you're in parasympathetic. But the problem we're seeing here in you know, this modern world is that we're bombarded by stressors all the time. And we are being put in a sympathetic state where the body's like, whoa, this is a really big deal. We need to step in and we need to introduce whatever we need to introduce to get through. And that's what an HPA dysfunction is, is that you're safe, you're not in a famine, you're not being chased by bears, but your body is chronically stressed, you're releasing all this cortisol that eventually you release so much of it, you're in the stressed out state, that eventually you're not releasing enough, right? There's different stages of having HPA dysfunction. And then when you get to that place, oh, there's so many symptoms you can have. You can have the you know, feeling fatigued and tired, even if you get a full night's sleep, you can feel wired and tired where you're fatigued, but your mind is running, running, running. You can feel like you can't handle stress. Like you find yourself losing your cool or going off on your family members and you don't, and your kids on, on your husband, your, your wife, right? You don't know why you're responding that way without realizing that before you even put your feet on the ground, you've already reached your threshold of what you can handle because you have been chronically stressed, you have been releasing this cortisol, you have had a hierarchy of needs focused on just getting by. And you know what's a really big stressor? For those of us without a thyroid or for those of us that have a dysfunctional thyroid or for those of us you know, that are on long-term thyroid is not being optimal in your hormones. That's a big, big stressor if everything is slowing down remember t3 is kind of like revving up that engine allowing every single cell to move forward if you are slowing down in that way how do you think you're getting by with your day like how do you think you're even managing you're managing from a place of survival you're managing from a place of like let me just get through the state. Even if you don't feel it on the outside, your resiliency, your ability to adapt, to fight off sicknesses, like to not always be sick, to not always have these bad allergies, to not always have some constipation or diarrhea growing on, you might not understand that it's all connected back to that. But if your body is in that state of just getting by and surviving, you can never be, you can never heal. You can never be optimal because you're not in that parasympathetic state. So a lot of these things I'm sharing is how can we get you back into that parasympathetic, parasympathetic state? I have had so many seasons in my life where I've been hypothyroid, where I haven't been on enough thyroid meds, especially at the beginning, but like postpartum and all these things. That is stress. That is a major stress. When you're not optimal in those hormones, that is a stressor that will always put you into this dysfunction, dysfunction when it comes to your hypothalamus, pituitary, and your adrenals. So where does sunlight come into all of this, right? Like what, okay, so you just started off with sunlight. Well, what's really interesting is that you have this CAR response, this cortisol awakening response in the morning where you see this significant increase of cortisol within 30 minutes after waking and an hour after waking. So a total of like an hour after waking. Now this cortisol awakening response is like this natural stress response. It is the most cortisol you should be making. It's a significant amount. And the reason why you're making all of that cortisol is because your body needs to go from a 
sleep state, not just waking up, but a sleep state to an alert state mentally and physically, right? So you have to release all this cortisol. But having an appropriate response within the first hour after waking sets the tone for the rest of your day. It sets the tone for what you're able to handle in regards in regards to stressors. It sets the tone in regards to how easily you'll be able to fall asleep and have a deep sleep. It sets the tone for all of that. Not only that, we know through research that that cortisol weakening response, that you know, that robust cortisol response is huge for you know blood sugar balance, for immune balance and modulating the immune system for your overall health. You have to have that appropriate response. And your body looks at external markers to know what to do internally, right? So we know about the circadian clock. If you don't know about that, the circadian clock is, you know, your your wake and sleep cycles, right? So cortisol should be highest in the morning, that peak of that cortisol awakening response. And then it should go down to the lowest in the, at night. And then at night, melatonin should be at its highest, right? So we have that circadian clock and the car response is an appropriate response. But this is the thing that is not talked about enough in your doctor's offices, but it's talked about a ton in research, right? Is that even though we live in these homes and we tend to be inside for most of our life, our body still has an intimate relationship with sunlight and moonlight. It has an intimate relationship with it. And your ability to get pure sunlight, especially within an hour, within the hour of waking, that peak time for the car response, or at least within three hours of waking, will help rebalance that cortisol response. So if you're having an overreactive car response or a, a depleted car response, it can be modulated, it can be rebalanced by that sunlight, right? I just came across a post by Dr. Huberman, who's a professor at Stanford, and he shared how there's at least 25 plus solid, good reviews and studies on how achieving sunlight within that peak time can change vision, can change your cortisol, uh, can change your sleep cycles, can do all of these different things. And all it requires is for you to go outside and get sunlight. Now, another thing that's really interesting is that there's a color light spectrum that's achieved. So it goes even deeper to the, deeper than that. We're talking about how our body reacts to the positioning of where the sun is versus um, how our body reacts to the color spectrum in the morning versus in the evening because the sun is at a different you know place in the morning than it is in the evening and the color spectrum from dark to light in the morning versus uh, light to dark in the evening creates and um, elicits a different response in our body so one of the best things you can do to support your hpa axis one of the best things you can do to help your body find a more balance on thyroid medications, if you're on thyroid medication, to help your thyroid um, be able to, you know, respond more appropriately to support that adrenal is getting sunlight in the morning. Now, I also recommend getting sunlight in the evening as well. Um, And at some point during the sun setting, going outside and getting sunlight. Now, I always recommend at a minimum five minutes, Um, or increasing to 30 minutes, even better. And that sunlight is going to help reset the circadian clock, right? It's going to help prepare you for when you do need to sleep, when you need to get deep sleep in the evening. And it's a simple thing that you can do is go outside and get sunlight to support the adrenals, to support your circadian clock. You want to get it within an hour, to three hours after waking. And if you're like, well, Dr. Beck, I wake up and it's dark outside because I go to the gym. Well, the second that you can go outside and get sunlight, turn on overhead lights as much as you can in the morning and in the evening, decreasing your exposure to bright light. Now, I know blue light blocking glasses are huge right now, but what I recommend to the women that I've coached or in my membership group is that when we're talking about blue light blocking glasses for the evening time, I'm not talking about those cool ones that you can get on Amazon that look slightly tinted. I'm talking about orange tinted 
<laughs> glasses, right? You want those real orange tinted glasses um, that are going to be protective, protective to your eyes and the brightness and the color like spectrum that we can be exposed to at night from our technology that we should not be getting exposed to. So a few things to help too with setting that circadian clock, which getting sleep, sleep, getting sleep is one thing, but getting deep restful rege like regenerative sleep is another thing right so you have to be able that how you sleep when you sleep how you fall asleep is also going to affect that car response so let's talk about some things that you can do in the evening so i already said those bright lights if as the sun is setting um you know, I, I actually, I spoke to my husband about this. I'm like, man, maybe we should start using candlelight. That's very natural light. We haven't committed to that yet. And I'm not telling you to do that. But as, you know, the, the evening is progressing, um, turning off overhead or bright lights, focusing on more lamp lights, focusing on light bulbs, that are going to be dimmer in the evening. So you're not having all this bright light exposure. You also want to focus on preparing your body for sleep around 10 or 1030. We know that that's going to be the most optimal time to allow your body to get into a deep sleep, that delta wave sleep, which is where your body wants to heal. That's where you download your memories. That's where you're going to burn fat. That's how you're going to detox, right, is that delta wave sleep. Let me tell you guys a little something here. How many of you guys can go to sleep and then you tend to wake up at like three or four um, in the morning? There's a few different things that, that can point to, you know, in Eastern medicine, there's some liver stuff there. But that's usually when you're kind of changing and shifting in the different type of sleep that you're having. So if I hear that someone in their health history and in their sleep diary, they're telling me that they're always waking up at three or four, I'm just thinking, ooh, red flag. To me, that's telling me that you didn't get into a deep enough sleep for long enough um, to stay asleep once you get out of that delta wave, right? Big red flag about getting deep restful sleep. So let's go back to what you can do at night. So dimming out the lights, making sure that you're fo focusing more on like reading books or just hanging out in the evening. And I know, I mean, like I'm a sucker for a good show, but if you're gonna do that show, turning down that brightness of the TV and putting on those orange, you know, light, like real orange, like, and I'll see if I can put a, a link here in my notes about some that I love so that you guys can have an idea for that. You you really want to do that. Now, another thing I think is really, really simple, a foundational thing to take into consideration, and, and you can just start doing this, and it can you can go deeper with this, is um, when you eat. That's another thing that that circadian system, like that when you're releasing cortisol, when you're preparing to release melatonin, it's affected by is when you eat. We got into this idea and we were told by doctors for a period there that well you know eat five or six you know meals a day and some of you guys might have doctors telling you that right now the only problem that we're having with that whole situation is that first of all eating that often especially if there's a lot of carbs in there you're recruiting that and you're having you're recruiting your insulin a lot right you are releasing insulin continuously throughout the day and you're not giving your body a break to digest food to process food to burn food to store food and a break from your pancreas having to release insulin if you're eating so many times throughout the day but the biggest thing is that our eating window is too broad right Another thing we know about how our body works within that circadian clock, and again, why are we talking about the circadian clock? Because we're talking about adrenal, we're talking about your resiliency, your cortisol, we're talking about um, how you respond to stressors. It's going to go back to how we can support this HPA access, which affects your thyroid. If you've gone hypothyroid, um, even if your levels get more optimal, you've got to work on nourishing and rebalancing that HPA access. So going back to what I was saying about when you eat, right? We know now with studies that when you're eating, 
you know, once you introduce food, you not only have your circadian clock of cortisol and melatonin, but your organs, your your different systems have their own clock, where when it introduces food, what they have found that the most optimal time for digestion, when things are going to be more alert and things are going to be, you know, ready to, to, take, to digest and process and absorb and all of that is going to be 10 hours after that first meal. But think about this. If we... Again, I get it. We're so developed. We got computers and we have all of this and we live in shelters and home, but our bodies are so primitive still. And I want you to understand that primitive doesn't mean like simple or dumb. It's powerful and that we still are connected with the sun. We're still connected with the earth, with with what the earth is doing. That being said, when would be the best times for us to focus on eating if we still lived you know, from the earth, right? If we were still farming, if we were still hunters and gatherers, when would be the most optimal time around when we have sunlight? What would we be doing when the moon is setting? We would be preparing, right? We'd be preparing, slowing down. We're not going to do as much, you know, in the evening time, but we can see that with our bodies and what, you know, the research is saying about how our bodies function, right? And so the best thing to understand is that the eating hour window is way too broad. 12 hours of eating, 11 hours of eating. We're going in and disrupting the body's preparation for sleep. So what are we looking at? Looking at, I, I have people shoot off, you know, like shoot for under 10 hours, nine, eight hours. Now, yes, there's intermittent fasting. We'll get into fasting on different episodes and intermittent fasting and all of this. But this is more of a circadian support. This is, this isn't, you know, when you do intermittent fasting, when you're saying, hey, I'm going to eat in this windows, you're not restricting. So if you're like, okay, I I listened to your podcast, Dr. Rebecca, I'm going to do an eight hour eating window. The purpose is not to decrease your calories and restrict your calories. Your purpose is to consume your calories at the most optimal times for digestion to support your body's ability to utilize those nutrients and then also support your body's ability to prepare for sleep or, you know, to prepare for work or whatever it needs to. So eating optimally in the evening is going to be really important. Also paying attention to the last time you ate, right? So, you know, you want there to at least be a three hour block. I say three to four just to be safe to kind of we're pushing it where you eat your last meal and you have enough of that time and space between your last meal and when your body needs to go to sleep and when it needs to rest. So that's that's a really big one, right? So we talked about sunlight, sunlight in the morning, sunlight in the evening. If you find yourself, because I do car tests, uh, cortisol awakening response tests, because some of you guys are like, oh, I tested my cortisol with my doctor. It's a blood work. And it was just one time. No, no, no. The best way to test for that cortisol response, like what's going on with your cortisol, is to do a saliva test over 24 hours. Now I'm going to give you a little disclaimer because you and I, you know, we're, we're, this is the thyroid talk, right? So I will tell you this. I don't like testing um, the car until I know uh, your hormones, your thyroid hormones are at least more optimal. Now, having a dysfunction within the HPA axis will make it harder for you to feel good on your optimal dose or will make it harder for you to feel good even if you're doing taking supplements and giving your thyroid all the nutrients it needs to get well. It will. It, it can make you feel all those symptoms of like hypothyroidism, right? So what I like to do is I want to make sure that we're at least within a range that is better and then add in that cortisol cortisol test, Right look at what's going on, how we can best support the adrenal. When it comes to the cortisol, without a doubt, it's one of the top things that has to be addressed for anyone with any kind of disorder because you want to be in a state for healing where it lasts. Absolutely. But when it comes to the thyroid, it's like uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? An adrenal dysfunction is going to make that thyroid be dysfunctional. But a thyroid dysfunction is going to affect those adrenals So it's like, okay, well, maybe I should work on my adrenals first. Okay, if you have a thyroid and you have a thyroid disorder, I think looking at a car test, you could look at a car test first. If you're post-thyroidectomy or you've been on thyroid medications long term, you need to make sure that is where it needs to be because it would suck for you to invest in a test 
And the reason why it's all out of whack is because the doctor didn't have you on the right dose for you, right? So that's kind of my little disclaimer there. I definitely think that if you have a thyroid, getting a car test um, right off the bat can be beneficial. But if you're on thyroid meds, that's one thing that's definitely going to affect that. So that's a really big deal. So if you want to get your cortisol tested, I will add a link in the show notes as well. So waking up, getting sunlight. Oh, the reason why I brought up that cortisol testing is because if there's different points in your day where you are feeling overwhelmed, work, whatever, one thing I tell my coaching clients, my membership mem- you know, members when we discuss different things is to go outside. Go outside for five minutes. Get sunlight. If this isn't just a feel good or whatever thing, it is literally your body responds to sunlight in such a beneficial way. So getting sunlight as much as you can throughout the day is going to be huge. Now let me add on another thing here. Go outside barefoot. (laughs) Go outside barefoot. Listen, I'm going to tell you guys this. I'll link this as well, but you can just look it up. There is a movie, a documentary called Earthing on Amazon. That's where we saw it. That's where we played it in our clinic. I tell people about it that you got to go watch it. It is incredible. Um, There's a lot of studies, you know, there's more studies that are coming out on it, on earthing. And what is it? There's earthing pads. Yes, I love earthing pads. I will also link, you know, one of my favorite companies that you can trust. And I'm pretty sure it's the same um, person who made the earthing documentary. But listen, let's just be real here. You can invest in an earthing pad, but like go outside barefoot. So what is earthing? Because we know there's, we, we are electrons, we are energy, there's ionic charges on our body, there's earn, energy, there's electrons, there are ionic charges within the earth. And when we go outside barefoot, it changes the conduction of our body, how our body responds. And when I pull up studies and consults and where I, I did a whole biohacking, I have a whole biohacking teaching in my membership group that talks about all these things. And I pull up these studies and people are like, oh my gosh, that's really cool. I, like they did a study on people sleeping on earthing pads that mimic kind of that same charge that the earth has. And they have a better cortisol response in the morning and throughout the day. They've done studies that says it, it decreases inflammation and it increases wound healing. It's, it, it affects blood flow. But I want you to remember something. Is like the earth the healing thing or is the healing in us? And we were meant to connect with the earth because we were meant to have this relationship with the earth. Yes. And you know, it's funny because like I feel like I sound kind of woo-woo, like let's connect with the earth. And, 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 and maybe you guys are like that. Like, are you, are you guys hippies, you know? Um, I, I was always very cynical and like, oh, you're telling me if I hug a tree and I go outside barefoot, that could really help. Yeah, I swear, that's literally what I'm telling you. And if I didn't see the studies and I didn't see the work that people are doing to tell people to go outside and to go outside barefoot, I wouldn't believe it myself. <laughs> but going outside barefoot, we were never meant to, and that that's a whole nother discussion, the type, the way that shoes are made, the way they're very slim, the way they don't allow our feet to develop appropriately, children need to be outside barefoot. You have to be outside barefoot. So when you're doing that morning light, when you're doing that evening light, you have people like, yeah, Dr. Becca, I go out and walk my dog for 30 minutes every evening. Yeah, but are you barefoot? (laughs) I want you to go barefoot. So after you walk your dog, go in your backyard and go barefoot. You need to ground, you need to earth, you need to reconnect to rebalance that cortisol, to really support your body in the things that it needs. This is foundational period. This is foundational. You you cannot, you, you're going to take all these supplements and do all these protocols and do all these things that everyone's talking about when your body's like, man, I am needing sunlight. I am needing clean air. I am needing to connect. And I think, I think that was one of the things that was so shocking to me when the pandemic happened was, um, you know, even in my own city, our local park uh was closed or walking bridge was closed and I'm just like I mean if you guys really understood the connection of our body with being outside you would not be doing this this is essential not just to our mental well-being but to our physical well-being in our immune system this is how powerful these things are doing these things are a really big deal okay So let's go ahead and go on. I got about two more things I want to touch on, right? 
The next, next thing I want to touch on is the lymphatic system. Um, doing things to help move the lymphatic system. Now, guys, I'm going to do a whole YouTube video uh, on how I dry brush and the connection there with the thyroid area. So make sure that you're, you know, find me on YouTube and you're subscribed to Dr. Rebecca Warren. But the lymphatic system is such a, a big deal. And most people don't really hear about any kind of connection within the lymphatic system, the thyroid, unless you have had like thyroid cancer and they found it in your lymph nodes. And then you're like, oh my gosh, they have to remove my lymph nodes, right? But everyone, everyone, whether you have a thyroid issue, you had your thyroid removed or not, you've got to understand the importance of the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system is part of your immune system. It moves junk. It attacks things. So you have this fluid within your lymphatic system, and then you have these lymph nodes where white blood cells go to break down viruses and junk and toxins and mold. That's what those lymph nodes are. You might notice it if you're sick, you can feel like a tenderness behind your ear or on your neck, right? You're like, oh my gosh, like it, it's like a round little ball. That's a, an amazing, that's great. That's showing you your body, your immune system is working to try to fight this thing off, right? But the lymphatic system, you have a chain of lymph nodes right where your thyroid is, a chain of lymph nodes, right? And so what your lymphatic system does, again, it's going after and it's clearing out, it's attacking. It is really, in its way, your own personal, powerful detox system, immune system, right? Why am I talking about the lymphatic system? Is because with a lifestyle that is more dormant, right? We are sitting on chairs, we're on our computer, we're on our cell phone, we're in the car, we are not working out. If we are working out, it tends to be more cardio, not really functional movements, like movements that would naturally come to us if we were outside working on our farm or, you know, cultivating the land. Like we are lacking movement. And why this matters with the lymphatic system is the only way you're going to get that junk out is through movement because the lymphatic system doesn't have its own pump. And I am just going back to how important it is, where the thyroid is, how you have, again, those complex change, chain of lymph nodes, right? You have a complex chain of lymph nodes there, you know, under your armpits, down in the groin. And the point of that is that's where you're bustling and moving things in to attack it. So think about all the things that could be affecting attacking your thyroid. Think about all the things that are still there even post-thyroidectomy. If there's a disconnect between your immune system and lymphatic system that contributed to you having your thyroid removed, it's still there. You have to move and pump your lymphatic system so it can dump out and be eliminated from your body. Being aware of your lymphatic system, getting that movement that your body needs is going to help your body get rid of junk. You want to heal your thyroid or you want to be optimal. This isn't just the thyroid. I'm just making that connection there because there's all these lymph nodes there. You want to move it. So what are some easy ways, right? I talked about dry brushing. I am going to do a video on all of this because if someone has had their thyroid removed or has a thyroid problem, hello, we got a dry brush. And of course, there's other benefits as well. It's exfoliating your skin, helping your pores. Um, some say it helps cellulite. I mean, other benefits there. But let's move that lymphatic system because we're so stagnant. Also, bras 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 ladies please don't sleep in bras don't sleep in bras and actually as much as you can don't wear them they congest a really important area within like your lymphatic system right it is tight and it causes a lot of clogs there right let me go ahead and say this I, I wanted to point out too, I hadn't mentioned yet that your lymphatic system isn't very deep. It's right below like your skin. So doing something like dry brushing doesn't need to be very, very hard. Now I'm going to talk about it. You can see it in the video on my YouTube page. But the biggest thing to understand, it's it's you use a, you use a brush, like a bristle, like you know those wooden 
um, brushes that you can use in the shower with those like beige colored bristles. And the whole point is to brush your skin multiple times. You do not have to hurt yourself. It does not have to be super hard, but you want to brush it towards the heart because that's where it's going to dump. And you do each section, like the front of your arm, the back of your arm, um, your armpits, your, your, your chest, your, your, your back, right? You want to keep brushing it towards the heart. And if you're going from down up you want to brush up towards the groin area to bring it towards the heart that's where you're going to dump out all those toxins now there's another really great thing that you can do uh a few different great things that you can do uh rebounding getting you know you see them um the old school little trampolines that you could do jazzercise on those are great to move your lymphatic system you get one it doesn't have to be i mean you can do intense workouts on that just so you know i've seen it very intense workouts. But getting this little trampoline has some amazing benefits on waking you up, getting blood flow, getting energy going, but moving your lymphatic system is a really good one. 10 minutes a day, you're watching a show, get up and bounce on that little trampoline. You can also do a vibration plate. There's some really, really great vibration plates in our clinic. We have medical grade vibration plates that help us with structural correction on the chiropractic side, but is also a really great benefit for the lymphatic system. And then finally, like the last thing is working out, um, using weights and then diversifying your workouts, not just always running, but using hand weights, using heavier weights, and then doing body weighted exercise where you're moving your body and moving your body a lot. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about it's going to be interesting, but I feel like by now you may have heard about this, right? Contrast showers, being in cold. Um, if you haven't, it's it'll, it'll sound weird. But this is the thing, is that our body becomes resilient under stress. Our body encountering a virus, a bacterial infection, being able to strengthen the immune system by attacking this thing appropriately and then, res- you know, returning to a balance changes our immune system it's called priming our immune system you know working out is a stressor right encountering the purpose in life is not to avoid stress the purpose in life is to have an appropriate response to stress and we don't allow ourselves to be put under good stressors very often um, that allow our parasympathetic system to be primed and balanced right to allow us to be able to get our body into more of a calming state. And contrast showers is that. Think about crazy this is. This is going back to our disconnect with the earth, right? Is that like with bad weather, we don't really have to deal with it, right? If it's cold outside, we're going to come inside and be really hot. Like I do this, right? If it's hot outside, uh uh-uh. My house is 65. My poor husband, I need it to be cold. But we don't have to interact with so many different degrees of temperatures. And you hear about these countries that will have their children out in the cold or they'll leave them out to kind of get used to it, to prime them. And that has amazing benefits on their body's resiliency. So, Dr. Becker, are you telling me like you want me to take a cold shower to help with my thyroid? Kind of, yes, that's kind of exactly what I'm saying. But what's really cool about doing contrast showers, and there's a few different ways you can do it. You can get into an ice bath. That's a really popular method that you see on social media a lot. Like people get into an ice bath and you see them concentrating. You can do it very, very easily in your shower. After you finish your shower, go as cold as you can get and allow your body to get used to that. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can go back to warm and then do it again you know, um, and and allow your body to get used to that. Now, let me, let me explain how to do it the right way, right? When I say get used to it, jumping around and like shaking yourself and like shivering, that's a sympathetic response. That's not what you want to happen. And you're probably like, you're really, you're really trying to kill me here. You just want me to be cold. (laughs) No, no. The purpose is that when you are in that cold bath, in that cold shower, you focus inward and you focus on your breathing. Breathing and taking, holding it in for a few seconds and then letting it out. 
few seconds stimulates the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is so important for your parasympathetic calming system. And breathing and slowing your heart, slowing your mind, and thinking through it, what you're going to find, especially as you continue to practice this, is how, in a way, I have people tell me it feels like the water gets warmer. It doesn't feel as shocking. And you're doing that through a very parasympathetic state. And the more you do it, the more you're training your body to get into this parasympathetic state because you're putting your body in a stressful environment of cold water. That's crazy. Cold water can create something in your body that allows you to respond better to stressors, that strengthens your immune system and strengthens your mind, that helps you feel better on the right dose of thyroid medication for you, or that helps your thyroid feel like it can handle stressors better, it can balance out better, it can convert better. (sighs) Working on that parasympathetic. And then you can take that breathing and use it throughout your day in the morning when you wake up using meditation or in prayer or when you're stressed out and overwhelmed. Taking that same breathing, you've already trained your body to go into a parasympathetic state by creating this vagal response. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right, guys. So that's it. That's that's the first part. I think like every topic that I'm going to share with you guys is going to be like multiple parts because I'm always like, man, I, I want to talk more about this. This one's a, this one, this episode's a little bit longer than my other ones, but there was so much to explain on the back end. So when I do part two, I'm not going to have to explain all the back end stuff, the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenals and the thyroid. Um, so that's, that's really huge. That's guys, you can start doing this today. Let's do everything we can to support the HPA access to then support our thyroid hormones so that we can be optimal. And we're not just surviving and getting by, that we can be optimal, that we can heal, that we can feel resilient, that we can feel like we can respond to stressors well. Start doing these, all of those. I mean, besides having to buy a brush and if you want to buy a vibration play or like, you know, an earthing mat, okay, but most of those are all free. And you can start doing today and start feeling a difference and start remembering as you're doing these things that your body's created to heal itself. It's remarkable. It's amazing. And it will get better and it can fight off diseases. It it can improve. You just got to, you just got to remember that. You just got to have hope in that and then remember, hey, how can I help my body respond to stressors better? And this is a great start. All right, guys, I will see you next time. All right, guys, thanks for tuning into today's episode. I'm going to take a few seconds here and answer some frequently asked questions I get asked when people find my podcast or if they find me on social media. And it might be a question that you have as well. But before I jump into that, I'm going to ask a favor. If you enjoyed today's episode or if this podcast has been helpful to you, I'm going to ask that you leave a review. I love being able to see how this is helping you on your health journey. And by leaving a review, you help me be able to reach more people with this message. And if you subscribe, you also have the chance to have these episodes automatically downloaded so you don't miss any future episodes that go live. All right, let's jump into this question. The first question I always get asked is, Dr. Rebecca, how do I work with you? Well, I'm excited to tell you guys about my amazing program. It's the Thyroid Inner Circle Membership. I love this program. I love this membership. It was a dream I had for so long about creating a space in a community where women can come together and learn how to take their health back into their own hands, how to heal themselves, not just the thyroid. We go over hormones and adrenals and gut health and detox. And every single month, there's two different sessions One session is focused on me teaching you about whatever the group is focused on doing health-wise, and then we do a Q&A session, whether that's about the topic or about anything at all, like how do I read my labs? But to find out more information about that membership group, go to thyroidinnercircle.com, and there you can find out how to sign up for it, what it looks like to be a part of that amazing program. The second thing I get asked is where do I start? Now, where you start is Have you done a complete wellness panel? If you go to my website, drrebeccawarren.com, you'll see a free optimal thyroid lab ebook. What you'll notice is in that ebook, I don't describe just what thyroid labs to get done. 
I go over a full wellness panel that I do on myself that I've done on women I work with throughout the years. It's so important to get your labs done, the right labs, and understand what's going on there. That's the first place to start. And last, the last question I want to touch on, it's usually from people that are living without a thyroid and just want more information on what that's like. Now, if you go to Facebook, I do have a free group there on Facebook. It's Healing After Thyroidectomy, where people are either going through that, living without it, and it's a great community where I pop in. So that's the Healing After Thyroidectomy group on Facebook. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you next time.